Hey, everybody. Um, really thanks, Brendan, for setting up this day. It's a super important conversation. Uh, it is something, as you will find out in this set of uh, things that I will share with you, is uh, something that affects me and my team's ability to do our jobs every single day. So if I don't know you, even though I know most of the people here, uh, my name is Dietrich. I've been working on IPFS related things for three plus years now, and maybe a little bit before that, worked on browsers for a long time uh, before coming over into this wonderful distributed Web3 world. And I lead the browsers and platforms team at uh, Outer Core Protocol Labs. And here's a sampling of some of the things that we're doing this quarter. As you can see, we work across a number of different areas, but the common denominator is really that we put IPFS into strange places where it is currently not. Uh, that's everything from browser integrations to uh, different mobile use cases, a lot of grants, uh, like I'll talk a little bit about uh, Move and the work that you saw earlier, why that's important, um, as well as things like open source tooling, uh, operating systems, and uh, use cases like space, metaverse, and IoT. So lots of places that uh, I think I, I would consider them hostile environments to IPFS as it's designed and implemented today, which is uh, really challenging. So I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done, the what what's worked in, in these initiatives, and what's been challenging or hasn't worked in these initiatives, and close with just a couple of thoughts about some of the gaps we've identified and some of the things that should be built next as all of us kind of come out of this conversation, think about what the next steps are for IPFS adoption to really uh, grow un unbounded by the limits of the very uh, few implementations that we have today. Uh, a lot of the work that we, that we do in, the, in this particular team and even, you know, really like the work that I've done since joining Protocol Labs a few years ago uh, is about talking to people that think about technology and the work that they and the software they're building every day pretty much like this, um, where it's a request, a response, and even when they're working with IPFS, oftentimes it still looks like this, uh, which is really, really challenging and often means that, that we're, you know, trying to figure out and negotiate how to add something that is paradigmatically different um, into their environment. And uh, sometimes at their behest, sometimes, um, and, you know, to address a use case or a business need that they have. And uh, often, and uh, oftentimes too, because we think that the, that particular space they're working in would be enhanced or um, improved, or their users would benefit by the addition of IPFS as something that is available and choosable to developers in, in a given environment. Um, because when you add IPFS, you end up with a topology that looks a lot different uh, with characteristics that are different, with use cases that are different, and, um, and to architectures that are radically different than what people are used to building today. There's a whole bunch of different challenges in, in doing this. Um, the technology has uh, momentum, and it is very difficult when adoption reaches a certain scale to change behaviors because they became integrated and abandoned. Uh, the tools that we use every day have a bunch of these kind of assumptions um, built in to them around what the security model is, what the privacy model is, uh, where data comes from, how it moves between different systems, uh, how fast or slow, uh, and even out at the glass and user features are designed with a bunch of the constraints of existing technologies in mind. And that's actually one of the bigger challenges from uh, you know reorienting people around what IPFS can do is the fact that they assume a certain set of behaviors or capabilities uh, that no that that are constrained to the given network implementation or the network architecture, the underlying protocol, which are really not true anymore. Um, there also might be new challenges they have uh, with these new architectures, new constraints that they're not familiar with as well. Like um, in in most Go IPFS APIs, where you make a request that never really truly ends, it can just keep trying for as long as there's uh, people left on the network to ask for a given resource, for example. So a very big paradigmatic difference from that, where you make a request, get a response, call it a day, move on. One of the, the challenges that we have in terms of have, getting things to work is oftentimes, um, these are not technology challenges in IPFS adoption. These are cultural challenges in adoption. Uh, sometimes these are cultural challenges in terms of the technology norms and the tools and the platforms, architectures and patterns that you're used to, um, but also challenges thinking about distributed networks um, and what they mean at the 
political, philosophical, and even sometimes moral level. And these are some of the challenges that we have uh, with even even really big groups, everything from browser vendors to standards bodies uh, in adopting IPFS. So it's not oftentimes just a technical challenge of a given implementation um, that that can be uh, problematic or need, is a point of negotiation. Uh, and this is something I really, and I'll tell this, tell this story to really underscore this in a few different ways, uh, but really cannot impress upon you how serious this aspect of the transition from um, from centralized technologies to decentralized technologies, uh, how important this, this aspect of it is and how much of a part it plays. So I'm gonna start by talking about the web browser work that we do. Here's kind of like an overview of Web, some of the bigger web browsers today and, and their status in terms of in implementing or adopting some of the technologies that we're talking about, um, IPFS in particular. Uh, as you can see, there's a surprising amount of green here uh, when I actually wrote this up, which is awesome. Uh, but at the same time, it's complicated. These, uh, these oftentimes are specific relationships. We'll talk about a couple of them um, and, and challenges. And sometimes people feel like they can talk about it. Sometimes they can't. Uh, and, and we have talked to a lot of folks at the major browser vendors and there's uh, IPFS is definitely in, increasing in recognition. People at least know what it is. Um, recently, the CTO of Mozilla wrote a, a post on his private blog, not a Mozilla one, talking about uh, IPFS and, and Beaker. Uh, which was really a step forward in terms of getting that the attention on these types of technologies and the type of capabilities that they offer to the web and some of the challenges that that they pose. So that things like that are are I think well what we'll chuck things like that that like that as a win in um, for our team um, and for the adoption of IPVS generally. It's just having the, having those conversations. Uh, it's, it's it's really complicated and we we do even at some of the some of the bigger ones even even Chrome we have folks that are um, we sometimes read signals right like. Uh, Google hasn't said anything about IPFS publicly, really, necessarily, or supporting it in, in Chrome. You know, we're working on Chrome export, uh, but, we're, but we're getting really good uh, turnaround times on on code reviews for uh, PRs, for example. So these are the types of kind of tea, tea leaf reading that we do sometimes. Uh, Brave shipped IPFS support last year, and this is one of the biggest, uh, I think, victories of IPFS adoption in larger uh, scale um, applications. Brave has over 50 million users monthly right now and growing really, really fast. So this is a really big opportunity. IPFS is available to over 50 million people in software that they probably use daily um, or pretty close to it. The, they implemented the support for the protocol and also bundled the ability to optionally turn on a support for a full node of Go IPFS so that downloads Go IPFS and starts running it. And um, there's some things that worked here, which is, you know, again, in the it's not all technical all the time. Uh, we had really enthusiastic collaboration with them. They're super interested. We embedded a engineer full time in their team. Uh, we made a bunch of decisions around the user experience of, of IPFS now it's presented to end users off by default, very, very clear privacy warnings. Uh, and then we experimented a lot. Like the first, first thing that they shipped, what it looks like today is pretty different. We made a bunch of UX tweaks. We had to change a bunch of things around how the, the address bar is uh, constructed, designed, and what it communicates to end users. We shipped a, a kind of light option uh, on by default with the full option off by default and the ability to configure that. Um, and then like kind of this cascading set of, of user uh, interface pieces where people could, if they, if they ran into IPFS stuff, they would be presented with these types of options. Um, so being very, very careful is something I think that really worked here. Uh, a lot of the problems are, how do you visualize how strong your connection is? Uh, the IPFS, Go IPFS node uh, approach is really about peer aggregation and bandwidth can, and, and kind of like bandwidth available, um, but pretty much just peer aggregation. Uh, so there's not really any norms or design language or um, kind of UX work that's really been done around how to, how to communicate things like that. How to communicate trust uh, when trust is defined by the fact that uh, with content addressing and IPFS, it means that nobody has modified the content that, you, that you've asked for. You 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 receive what you ask for and you are guaranteed that by the protocol. Um, however, the traditional web approach to trust is that the website you loaded was granted a DNS name and a which is encoded into an SSL certificate, which uh, you can walk the SSL cert chain all the way up to a certificate authority and the combination of those things and the browser having that CA cert in, um, integrated into it means that you can trust the website. So the, the way trust is defined is radically different 
Um, it means very, very different things to end users. And in specific use cases, how do these things live together? How do we communicate them? Still very, very much undefined. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that has been a problem for a long time in IPFS, which it was exacerbated when you actually gave regular people access to a full node is where is my stuff? Uh, with a website, your stuff is on that centralized website server. Uh, with IPFS, maybe it's in your node, maybe not. It's pinned, it's not pinned, it got garbage collected. Maybe it's somebody else's node. Uh, it's out there in, in the data soup of the distributed web, very unclear. Um, and so each one of these things is a learning for future implementations and approaches that we take. Uh, we're, we've been working with uh, Galia on Chromium fixes for quite a while now and really moved from, you know, sort of like web compatibility fixes around the security model for local host access and things like that um, into lean, into more directly addressing what IPFS support would look like in, in Chromium. And, you know, it, there's there's basically not really any way to easily bundle something like IPFS and Chromium. Um, what Brave did, while well, is an incredible achievement, is also not really the end state that we need to be in for a broader adoption of what IPFS implementation native to the web platform would be. Um, so some of the things that have worked so far in this partnership um, in a community that is generally skeptical of uh, Web3 stuff generally, crypto generally, of um, where the kind of like security, because of the security and privacy assumptions and, and models of the web today, of Web2, uh, the IPFS approach is treated very much with skepticism and, and frankly is considered quite dangerous for a bunch of use cases. Uh, so things that have worked, going very slowly, being very uh, understanding and, and aware of the concerns that people have. Um, a very credible partner that has, you know, Galia has commit rights on uh, Gecko, WebKit, and Chromium, uh, building up trust by uh, working on web compatibility stuff across all three browsers, uh, not just going, let's, you know, like bolt IPFS onto here and, and as fast as we can, um, focusing on the re-architecture of how Chromium supports non HTTP protocols generally, not going full IPFS again, and then really, um, you know, working to cultivate a relationships with the communities and the people that we need to be able to collaborate with um, and get code accepted and proposals accepted and, and be to, you know, who would be embedding or bundling IPFS in their end user products as well. Um, things that have been really challenging, this really HTTP blinders up and down the Chromium stack, uh, it means it's going to take a while to do this work. It's not just a um, throw a bunch of throw a bunch of engineers at it and see how fast we can go. Really, the network stack that we have in, in Go IPFS today and the lib P2P approach of peer aggregation isn't really functional for most desktop class computers. It I mean, de browsers today, or at least for, for desktop web browsers as they are today. Desktop web browsers don't really have listening sockets. They don't have, uh, they have transient connections. Um, sometimes they have persistent connections, uh, but a lot of that is also not, not really at the protocol level. It's not handled by like in, in Chromium and, and, and Gecko, it's an entirely separate network process. It manages all that network communication. Um, so anything that is doing you know, like network activity outside of the bounds of that architecture is really problematic. So we really need to rethink for broader and native IPFS adoption in the web platform, kind of what the network architecture looks like. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and how this is a recurring theme in the work that we're doing. Um, and IPFS Companion is, is our browser extension. This is another vector for us to be able to get into web browsers in an interesting way. It, it was interesting and it's getting less interesting. Um, the kind of surface area of capabilities and APIs and things that you could do with a web browser extension is reducing over time. Um, it has, uh, with Manifest V3, which is a new version of web extension APIs and architecture of how web extensions, browser extensions are created, uh, pushed by Google and now adopted by um, Mozilla, who's expected to ship this by the end of the year, the latest update, uh, it really reduces what you could do inside a web browser. It offers up some new interesting opportunities too um, for us to be able to add things like protocol support in a way that is uh, less, of a, less of a battery uh, and CPU destroyer. Um, so it, that's actually going to be nice for browser and user experience, which is really important, but also pushes on us the need to really radically re re-envision what, um, what kind of what the architecture of IPFS in a web browser actually is going to be, what, what it needs to be. Um, so there's challenging there. We've rewritten IPFS Companion from scratch uh, in, the, in the last 
couple of quarters. So we're ready for this transition, but we did have to remove features that we had before. And whereas I think at one point, it was really thought about extensions might be a vector for native like channel through which we could implement more native IPFS support, that opportunity is just growing smaller over time. And we really expect that even uh, a lot of our partners will actually be pushed out into kind of a companion type of approach where we have a local node uh, doing uh, local HTTP or IPC over to that local node somehow. Mobile is an area that we do a lot of work in. Uh, you saw, you know, Mo was doing some work on mobile with uh, Agrigore. And uh, one of the groups that was really early in experimenting with mobile is Birdie. And Birdie implemented um, one a very interesting approach of embedding Go IPFS entirely with, um, with Swift and Kotlin bindings. So you can uh, more easily em embed Go IPFS into mobile applications. Than, and, and, while this was an incredible achievement, again, similar to Brave, very early on in the kind of maturation phase and the adoption of these technologies, uh, a very much a bolting on of something that doesn't kind of natively fit in. Uh, it, uh, they also implemented a libp2p transport for not just Bluetooth LE, but kind of like a suite of different platform specific approaches to proximity uh, communication and detection, including Bluetooth, Bluetooth LE and some other things. Um, and they've been experimenting, experimenting with kind of this higher level patterns of proximity based connections. Uh, that, that is going to be really, really valuable in the long term, I think. And, you know, can, something that worked there was having a team that had a very specific use case. Uh, they don't, they're not doing anything broader IPFS related. They're focused on their messaging, private messaging app, and they're really using that to drive development. Kind of the same approach that we saw in, in Jeropo's talk earlier, this like focusing on a very specific use case and spiking on that in order to be able to get some really important learnings and things that can be applied to the rest of the system. Um, they had a very specific focus too on local and offline technologies. Uh, and they also have really taken a kind of slow, slow development approach intentionally, working directly with their community, working and getting constant user feedback, um, which you know, is is very different than a lot of teams where they're like, all right, we're not going to talk to users. We're going to sprint on this code, get it to where we think it is what we think it needs to be, uh, and then ship something. They've really taken kind of the opposite uh, approach there. And only recently, I think, even opened up um, public betas. Uh, a lot of the challenges are that they're kind of going against the grain of the architectures by putting Go IPFS in there, uh, the native uh, architectures, the network architectures of the devices they're embedding in, choose a lot of mobile device resources, um, and the kind of like the process that anybody who's tried to use Go Mobile IPFS integrated their application, that build process is, is pretty tough and, and pretty tricky to get right. They spent a lot of time working on that um, because of that not kind of non-native alignment and integration. During this, another recent uh, project that we've been doing with a company called Trigram, uh, partnering on a different approach towards native IPFS applications on Android and iOS. And this is really the opposite. Like, how do we how do we integrate IP, basic IPFS and user tasks into mobile operating systems in a way that aligns very closely with their user model? Um, what like sharing images, uh, publishing images, receiving images, things like this, like basic things, uh, documents, uh, loading, uh, opening uh, IPFS scheme URLs um, or URIs, uh, things like that. So is exploration to these types of things. We've got a bunch of things working so far. It's been really good to start small. It's really worked well uh, to align very closely with the user model of the device that you're embedding IPFS into. Uh, thinking about the user tasks that are most common to daily daily things that that we do, and that's really really helped us in terms of being able to figure out what the how to prioritize those features, how what works and what doesn't. Um, being able to like relay uh, the IPFS scheme out to any uh, other applications or handling that application um, intents and things like that has, has all been really good. And I think we're going to actually end up probably with kind of a daily driver type of application for working with IPFS, IPFS data and services uh, through this application over time. Um, some of the, you know, that, that those are the things that worked well. Is, and, and there we went the opposite of the, the, from Birdie. We didn't go full or, 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 and uh, Agrigore. We didn't go full IPFS. Um, just really, really limited bits based on what the embedded, what the available operating environment allows us to do. Um, where, do where do we go from here? Does it end up looking like a full browser is, is one of those challenges. Like, but where do we take these learnings? How do we apply them? How do we get more people to be able to copy um, and use this, this code, this approach in some of these learnings? Agrigor, uh, you heard from over earlier. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I do want to underscore how important this work is. Um, this is one of those things where 
Uh, we really learned a lot so far around uh, embedding and modifying and embedding Chromium. Um, and also with a, a little bit around what the, you know, the, the benefit of being driven by a specific single use case and community. So the things that worked were that really like laser focus on a specific use case has actually resulted in application model learnings um, of, of the kind we're seeing with their little microblogging application um, and the integration to web platform itself, as opposed to trying to route around the web platform with things like localhost URLs and stuff like that, uh, that is real, honestly, like just in this small grant, in this small period of time, We've learned more, I think, about what the what an application model for IPFS would be um, than a lot of the previous work where we kind of like bolted on or routed around. Um, so it's been really valuable. When it comes to challenges, Moav wrote a really long post, which is the first of a couple, really detailing kind of like just how, what it takes to build a Chromium fork and, and ship it on a, on a mobile device that's really worth reading. So we're really excited about the outcomes of the work that's going to happen there. Capiloon is a mobile operating system. This is based on KaiOS, which was originally based on Firefox OS. And um, they forked the updated version of KaiOS, which has much more recent uh, versions of Gecko inside. And we did a grant with them and uh, to add IPFS features. And what's interesting here is that they ended up, um, one, you have a, you know, a mobile operating system which is an almost entirely web technology based uh, that has IPFS and uh, IPFS support. And they're also using IPFS in the making of it. So things like build distributions, um, when you actually download the pre builds if you've ever done mobile, a mobile operating system development, you have to download all these binaries that need to be put on the device. So they're using IPFS for distribution of that, which has been uh, really interesting. Having full control of the OS stack where we have a lot of like, basically do whatever we want on that operating system has been really uh, interesting for learning about embedding. And it's going to be a great place for us to experiment with what a, with re-envisioning what a native IPFS would be on these devices. Um, the, uh, some of the challenges are really like a bet on Gecko is really great at this point. Um, the, you know, Mozilla is not really supportive of these kinds of efforts right now and definitely not around Web3, not supportive at all. Um, they've definitely hit, they've hit some issues too. And I think this is a, a blessing and a curse. Uh, while using IPFS for the building and distribution of the operating system, they're also hitting a lot of problems where they're you know pinning to our services, like to interesting services like Estuary and, and Web3 Dust Storage, but then pulling them through the gateway and hitting problems. So they're uh, kind of like regularly relaying issues that they're having, which is making our services better and the gateways better, uh, ultimately, which is good, but it's also challenging for them. Um, we've definitely hit the, the network architecture problem here. Uh, uh, private data is actually something I didn't list here. There's a really important use case for mobile devices. Um, and then I think the last one is again, like what is an IPFS application? We don't have an application model. It's a data layer and a protocol that can be used in infinite ways without having a higher level security model, privacy model, uh, features and capabilities and permissions model. Um, it, it's a new set of challenges to be able to answer those questions when designing an application. Uh, we've been doing a lot of open source tooling integration too. Uh, we recently got FFmpeg and MPV support landed. Um, and th this has been fascinating. Some of the, one of the things that worked here, again, like uh, not, not going full IPFS, like meeting the community at where they're at, having long, like this was months and months of negotiations and conversation with that community to figure out just the right set of environmental variables to be able to configure kind of what the fallback and connectivity schemes are. We had to learn a ton in the challenges section here around uh, how, how and what to communicate to users about what it means when they're using IPFS, um, how to detect and fall back to local node, uh, be able to or, or fall back to gateways while you know trying for a local node first, and hopefully that we we actually start out of this work to standardize on a little bit for open source tools and libraries what this IPFS integration could look like uh, across a broader base and maybe eventually operating system integration. Um, we're working on curl as well, and there are patches there. And, and interestingly, like really quick when you're trying to get other people to adopt your stuff. Um, or, or add your stuff to their stuff instead of them getting to use your software, uh, which is a really different uh, dynamic. Uh, you know, the, the curl maintainer, Badger, immediately was like, I can't find this stuff. You could point it to our IPFS specs repo, but if you ask anybody that works on the IPFS project, they're like, no, 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 no. Don't look at the IPFS specs repo. The Go IPFS code is the reference for the spec. So we, we have a really complicated situation for even people that are supportive and interested in adopting IPFS when pointing to our own specification for the protocol, which is really a really big challenge. IPFS Tiny is another uh, in interesting and different implementation approach. 
Uh, this is a C++ implementation of bits of IPFS. So far, they've gotten all the way like addresses and IPLD, and I, I think IPLD started working last week. Um, this idea is to run this on embedded devices and also some of the work that we're doing uh, in with space industry. And uh, what's worked, we're, we're not totally sure yet because we haven't deployed this code anywhere. Um, not, not trying to do libp2p at all so far has worked and that they've gone farther in the construction of the core libraries and things like that. And honestly, these devices that we're looking at aren't gonna be able to run full libp2p anyway. One of the biggest challenges in this kind of work is the first question everybody's like, why C++? And every time I hear that question, I have to be patient and under, and, and really explain um, kind of the dynamics that we have and in, in getting people in, in meeting people where they're at in order to be able to increase the chances of adoption. The embedding world is almost entirely C++, C++ and people are why, why not Rust? And Rust in embedding is, while it's way more mature than it was three, four, or five years ago, it's not the default. It's very far from it. And the number of production devices, when you're thinking about like hundreds of millions of devices being manufactured and shipped, uh, Software change in, in that type of, of, of industrial scale is very, very slow. So we need to be very, very careful. And people who are going to be making adoption choices around protocols are going to be using C++ for, for what, another decade, two, three, four? Um, so while we're also doing some work in encouraging embedded Rust use where we can, uh, things like this, like uh, these are embedding experts who work in space industry and uh, connected device industry and for, for them, it was a bit like we had the conversation for them, it was a very clear choice that the C++ was going to be the best. So sometimes the, the biggest challenges are our own communities who think they know better about a whole given industry or, or environment or area um, and, and aren't really interested in this particular you know, the approach towards implementation. Um, finally, one of the areas that we're pushing on right now too is space industry, where there's a bunch of different use cases where kind of like offline local first uh, by default data architectures, uh, Configure con configurationlessness and nodelessness of IPFS when you're able to refer data um, by content addresses instead of locations. Also, very, very um, powerful features when it comes to uh, very slow, dodgy communications and very expensive data communications platforms. Or you might have space to space devices that need to kind of like uh, have loosely coupled data connections and interactions. Um, IPFS, again, very, very uh, powerful way to address some of these use cases. Uh, things like aggregating data across when you have like, you know, four, six minute windows of data availability today as satellites are going by. Uh, things like IPFS and be able to refer to larger data sets in aggregate uh, across a number of disparate ground stations is gonna be really interesting. And we're gonna do some tests um, the, hopefully in the next year with uh, different groups who are interested in this. And, and again, like, I don't think we know what's worked well yet other than assuming we, we know so far that the network architecture of our current implementations is a non-starter, really, given the constrained network environments that we need to operate in. Um, some of the other things are uh, unsurprisingly uh, aside from highly constrained environments are, you know, really highly proprietary code and, and companies that are, and, and um, people that are used to working under that type of secrecy and, and operations. Uh, so we'll be able to share more, uh, but I think it's really going to push on our assumptions around what the network architecture of, of IPFS needs to be. Um, so I'm, that, that's pretty much the, the, the tour through some of the challenges of things that have worked, things that haven't worked, where the, we've taken the current implementations and sort of jammed them into environments where that, that are maybe hostile to it for a variety of different reasons. Um, IPFS does not have an application model and that it, technically neither does HTTP, but the unbelievable success in the web platform of being in everybody's daily life almost all day, every day has made that application model and really made clear that having an application model that kind of like uh, very clear, idiomatic, that is agreed upon by known parties, standardized, interoperable, uh, really increases the chances that people can build the things they need to build and that they can do it in ways that are safe for their users. And so develop, the development of that application model and the integration with the web platform at some level, um, I think is incredibly important uh, area of work for IPFS adoption in a gap that we have not yet filled, um, but we're, we're making some progress there. IPFS implementation today, I think is inverted. Like we really, by, by developing a node first application where we say you run a node, uh, that has really been a, the num probably the biggest point of friction and even getting people that really are excited about it to actually be able to adopt IPFS. Um, we, need, we need people to be able to add IPFS to their stuff instead of forcing them to run IPFS and then figure out a way for IPFS to interact with it. Uh, the local HTTP uh, API approach is really 
cumbersome, even even though it seems like it wouldn't be. It causes a lot of issues. Lo local IP, local HTTP connection isn't uh, well supported in the web platform anyway, and that's one of the things that we really push on the edge of in our work with Galia. And we have it; it's better than it was, but even still, like WebKit won't won't make some of the fixes that we need for it to really work. Um, there's not enough libraries from the communities developing libraries for languages themselves. And I really want to make clear that distinction. Like, it's not that like we like we can go and we can write a library for for Python, but like our Python library is kind of unsupported. We don't have anybody really pushing on making it better. Maybe just people do fixes or chores on it. Um, and so we're not meeting the needs at all. There's like not really a, re a reasonable choice for something that is is native and idiomatic to Python, for example, the number two programming language in the entire world. Uh, so that that is really a huge gap and we're really in investment and strong ownership and um, partnership and collaboration with the communities who are building their, their stuff in their way, as opposed to trying to get them to come to us. I think language elitism is also really, really challenging. Like, Thinking, well, why would you in, why would you implement um, IPFS in JavaScript when you could do it in Go? It would be much better for that. Um, I I really believe that when it comes to technology adoption, there's no best tool for the job. There are choosable tools, and developers choose the tools that are available to them. And there's a bunch of re availability can be defined in many different ways. Uh, what is the language I know? What what is the operating environment that I have to run in? Not the one you would love for me to run in. Uh, there's like all kinds of reasons why people make choices around of make technology choices and adoption choices and you need to understand the reasoning behind them and oftentimes that is not the the you know lead engineer of project x uh, deciding what the what the best tool for the job is uh, this is especially true for something that calls itself a protocol but we have to be we have to be choosable in in all of the environments and that's how http1 we need to be like water in that same way uh, transport transport agnostic cannot mean only libp2p. And I think this is one of the things that is like, when we talk about IPFS, oftentimes we're talking about libp2p, uh, especially when we're talking about challenges, when we're talking about, um, you know, code that people don't, and APIs people don't really understand how they work, um, the high dependency on the public DHT and things like that too. Without strongly decoupling these things when we talk about them and really treating IPFS as something independent of libp2p, where libp2p can be used for the um, for the transport layer, or for the for the network architecture layer underneath IPFS, we need to be able to have other alternatives for at the network layer. Um, and then finally, the, the idea of transient network connections versus pers persistent peer aggregation as a model for uh, connectivity and improving the chances that a given request will actually su succeed for data. I think that model is fundamentally problematic for most places. Like even when it comes to private data, like you, you see, we're seeing large, lots of groups put encrypted data on public networks, which is kind of a non-starter for, for a lot of security professionals. Um, so we need to be able to have models where you can have an IPFS connection, maybe between one, two, between two, three, four peers to be able to exchange data and then shut that network down or so, some alternative ways of looking at how, how transmission of data and, and connection between peers happens that isn't put it on the, on the public DHT um, or uh, put encrypted data onto public networks. We need to be able to have a much more adaptable and configurable approach towards how uh, what a network is and how it is constructed, how data is routed around it. So those are some of the things that we've done. Those are some of the things we've learned. Uh, and sorry if I went a little 